everyone. I'm glad that we've moved the chairs away. <laughs> Last year it was really, really warm here, and in heated <laughs> debates, you don't want to it's get nice. any warmer. <laughs> so thanks everyone for being here. I'm so excited to be here and discuss this important <coughs> topic with you. And what are we discussing? Right? We all agree, the problem is that we all agree that learning has fundamentally changed. How we consume con content has fueled this, but the educational systems haven't really kept up. And what we're going to talk about is, what is the biggest problem in education today? So I'd like to begin with asking each one of you for your own opinion. Esther? The biggest problem in education today is that we're teaching for the wrong century. Teachers are just unfortunately stuck in the lecture-based model, and it's really hard for them to move. I would say that's the number one problem. Uh, I could, couldn't agree more with Esther, but I'm more than happy to mention another problem we are having. We were just discussing about the stuff, for example, that Esther is doing at Palo Alto High School. Amazing, mind-blowing, and it could be useful in every country of the world. The things that Michael are doing are great, but the problem is no one knows about those things. So education, the world of education is extremely local and ideas, innovations don't spread at all. And I think that if we are not fixing this one, it's going to be extremely difficult to fix the education systems. Yeah, and I think Al Gore's <laughs> opening speech was really interesting on the importance of solving global challenges. And to do that, we really need hundreds of thousands of bright, uh, excited, passionate scientists around the world. So, uh, and, and some of the things we see in education is that more than 50% of students in science drop out of their education because it's not inspiring, exciting, or, or fun for them to do their careers. So I think a big challenge that we're facing is engaging the new generation in education and make them really passionate and excited about uh, their, the challenges ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I guess I'll, I'll share my own view, which is why I gathered you around here to begin with. I think the problem is that as much as I love these shoes, us wearing the same shoes, us learning the same things in the same way doesn't make any sense. I feel that personalization and learning needs to happen because, uh, well, it's just, it's just not efficient or effective right now. But the next question is, how do we prioritize this, right? Do we, do we think, do we need to think bottom up or top down? Of course, it's both. But what do you think needs to happen so that these people in this audience can affect how fast we change? Well, first, I think it's really important for the leaders and the community and all of you here today to know that you personally can make a difference by expressing yourself, talking about it to your leaders, talking about it in the schools. And I have now this new website just created today, actually, oh. called moonshots.org. And what it does is helps you start a moonshot in your school, your country, wherever you are, and it includes 100, which is probably the most amazing website out there, giving ideas to teachers for the what you personally can do in the classroom, whatever you want to do. Don't keep lecturing. Give kids an opportunity to actually make a difference. And then they'll be passionate. Passion is the key. And they can pick a great project. Just check out that website there. And then also moonshots.org. I just want to, I think we should give Esther a round of applause for launching this today. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, thanks for surprising us, <laughs> right? Uh, well, I kind of like tend to hate when you are saying that these kind of things don't happen in education, because that's not the fact. There's amazing things happening in education daily, in, in Palo Alto, in Finland, in Sweden, in Denmark. And, and I think that we are giving a wrong perception when we are saying is that all the education systems, all the schools are broken, because there's great exceptions happening. And again, the problem is know-how. We don't know about those. And if we are analyzing how to make the change happen, I think that there isn't any industry where the, where the uh, revolution is happening top-down. It's always happening bottom-up. Right. Uh, so it starts with the teachers, it starts with the schools, it starts with the forerunners. But the education systems are full of gate... The systems are full of gatekeepers. Top level are saying is that Yes, but this would never... For example, the things that Esther are doing, 
uh, all Michael are doing. Top level can say that yes, but they are so Silicon Valley, they would never work in Finland. And that's not the case if you are asking from teachers. Right. Teachers would, would love it. So I think that one of the fundamental problems we have to fix is trust. We have to trust teachers. We have to educate them better. We have to give them resources and we have to trust. But Saku, is the role of the teacher the same as it was Absolutely even 10 years not. ago? Absolutely not. And it, it's sort of like being, being top down, it's bottom up, it's... it's uh, Cross. Go, uh, there's, there's so many changes happening. But the problem is that all of these are big changes. And I think that we need to re-educate teachers. We have to put more resources. And we have to understand is that from the teacher's point of view, the change is massive. And if teachers are getting burnt out, if teachers are not enjoying the chains, the whole system collapses. So we have to respect the teachers. Right, right. Yeah. I think we all agree with that, right? Uh, I agree with that. I mean, the teachers are the key. Teachers need to be respected. After all, just think about it. Teachers are taking care of your most precious possession. We need to appreciate, respect, and trust the teachers. Yeah. I don't know a single teacher who did not go into education to make a difference. And then as time gets, goes on, they become you know, burned out because there's so many rules that re are interfering with making a difference. I'm excited because I've found something that we can disagree on. Oh, okay. good. We won't really disagree. <laughs> but I'd like to flip that. As a student, I've, I've been very fortunate to live in a number of different countries, go, go through, I think, five different educational systems, and have the fortune of seeing both the best of the worlds and sometimes the worst of the worlds. And I've seen as a student that you kind of, you're in a lottery as a student to get a good teacher, right? Yes. And to me, as an investor, the reason why you know, we invested, invested into Labster is to take some of that randomness out of the equation because <coughs> me learning should not be a function of my luck of getting you as an amazing teacher. And you are an amazing teacher. So it should be about you know, giving the tool set to learn and the teacher should be coaching you to do the best possible thing that you can as a student, right? Yes. So, where does technology come in here? How is Labster changing the world in terms of how we learn? Yeah, I think it, it's a really, really interesting point. And I love the Moonshot Initiative, by the way, I checked it out today. Um, I think it's about empowering the teachers to be part of this transformation. And what we've seen is that technology can play a really big part in this. We have work often uh, with teachers to create technology that empowers them through data, giving them information about the different students in the classroom, how can they better act as a coach or a mentor right. in the classroom, rather than spending their time on the monologue lectures or grading papers. All of those things, we need to leverage technology to automate, and then empowering the teachers through education and showing uh, great examples. I love what 100 is doing by showing great case stories from mm -hmm. teachers who've successfully made this shift to adopting technology. So have more of those success cases. Sharing that with uh, the teachers, I think that's one of the keys on how we can make this uh, change happen. Yeah. Saku? But it's, it's one thing that is extremely important to understand when we are discussing about education. And, and, and that's, we can easily concentrate on creating the best course in the world. We could concentrate on on having great technology in certain amount of schools. But in order to create a great society, we need to have excellence and we need to have equity. So practically every school has to be great. And then if you are taking it to the global scale, the problems many countries are facing are huge. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a need for 30 million new teachers and no one knows where to get them. So when we are trying to talk about changing education systems, one thing is to have brilliance, but then the other thing is, is kind of like to have a equity throughout the system, and that's complicated. A question to you then, right? And, and I wonder about this. Is it, are we really talking about there to be, that there is a need for 30 million teachers? Are we talking about how many end users, students, need to be educated, right? Yeah. And, and we talk about scale in technology, right? That takes away some of the pressure from how many teachers you some. need per student. So my question, and this comes here from the fireside. Thank you guys for the questions. I thought it wasn't working. Now it's working very well. We'll try to tackle some of the questions here. Is the challenge more in the format or in the content of what school education... Oh, it's now... Okay, great. 
<laughs> sorry, I, I don't know how this works. Uh, but the question is, is the challenge more in the format or the content of school education? It's more the format. So in other words, what you want to do is give students an opportunity to learn independently together with the peer. Peer right. group learning is most effective. And so that's the format. The content, the content hasn't really changed all that much, or if it does change, it changes sort of marginally. But it's the question is how to get those kids excited about it. And when they use the, a computer or a pat, tablet or a phone to get that information and then share it with their peers, that is more f exciting and effective than just sitting there passively and listening to a lecture. Because we all know what happens. You know, you're daydreaming about what you're going to do next weekend, right? You're not listening to the lecture. So engagement. Engagement. Yeah. Active yeah. engagement is the key to getting them excited. And, um, and all the way, the culture of the classroom is also the key. And I put it together in my book, um, Moonshots in Education. It's called TRIC. TRIC stands for Trust, Respect, Independence, Collaboration, and Kindness. And that belongs in every classroom. And I can tell you that kids respond to that. When they feel that you care about them, you trust them, you respect them, you treat them with kindness, I'll tell you, they'll do anything. And they get really excited about it. So that hasn't changed, other than the way we treat children today still needs to move to the trick concept. Right, right. And that's the, that's that's, the less scalable part. That's the difficulty, right? That's the social, emotional, yes. you know, that's why we do things. Actually, if you just think about it in the workplace, you work harder when you're trusted and respected, right? I mean, everybody does. And so why not do that for kids in the classroom? So and collaborative that's, education. That's right. But, 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 but yeah. one of the problems we are having with education system is that I, I'd say that we are overthinking or even over-memorizing and yeah. underdoing. So we are not doing enough things in schools. And for example, what Esther is doing in, in Palo Alto is that the way they are studying democracy or elections or whatever is by creating news, creating videos, creating articles of those. And I think that that kind of systems, because you can, you can learn so many things by doing stuff, by creating articles, videos, TV shows or whatever. And I think that that's a great example of things. We, this new uh, digital technology is creating us huge amount of opportunities on change education, and we are not using those practically right. at all. And, and can, just can I quickly yeah, add, add to that point? Just because I don't think it's necessary between content or format, and we were talking a little bit about this earlier as well, that it's much more about adoption. How yeah. do we, because everyone agrees on great ways to do it and great content. There's hundreds of ed tech startups out there, and you're highlighting a lot of the good ones. It's more about how do we get the teachers to embrace it in the classroom. So, so, and I think that's the topic we should really be discussing. Yeah, yeah. and then could I, could I oh, okay. respond yeah. to that? So, and you have the same possibility through 100. Um, you know, most teachers, they don't feel really comfortable with tech. I don't think that's a big surprise to anyone. And so, one of my students, Miriam Hendler, she created this app, and it's called Moonshot Squad. And what it is, if a teacher that doesn't know how to do something from like start your smart board or whatever, they just request somebody from the Moonshot Squad to come to their class and help them. And guess who's on the Moonshot Squad? Students, all the students. I'll tell you, they all know what's going on in tech. And they sign up, they get community service credit, and they help the teacher. Yeah. So I think you also have an app you like that as well. Yeah that works, you said Student already. Student agents. Yes, and it works here in Finland. Right. I think it can work in all countries. They could have something like that. You just have to realize how smart those kids are in your class. They're smarter than you think. Right. But I then think going back to what Michael said, because I, I think that that's the fundamental question, how do you really make the innovation spread? And it's quite easy to say is that, for example, that kind of innovation saying, it would never work in our country or it would never work in our school. And I think that the only way to solve that one is to tell success stories. Right. So if I'm saying that it would never work in our country, then I said, yeah, maybe, 
but it's working in 48 other countries. It's more <laughs> difficult to say that it would never work in here if it's successful. And like the student agents, for example, in Finland, which is exactly the same that you were talking about. It's at, today, it's more than 80 schools in Finland. And if it's working in 80 schools, it's quite difficult to say right. that it would never work in our school. I mean, and in a this sense, in need. a sense, and you don't make innovation spread. Innovation spreads, Spread. right? And you, you have to be telling about them spreading. Yeah. So, so the good news is that innovation education is spreading. One of our other portfolio companies, Kahoot, is now over at over 50 million monthly active users. Part of the 100 as well. That's a great oh, yes. company. Yeah. And, and how did this happen? It wasn't top down. The teachers did not create budgets so as to, or so, sorry, the schools did not create budgets. Policymakers didn't make budgets. It was the students and the teachers trying to find a way to work together collaborative right. tool. And it's been so successful now that teachers are trying to get budgets so as to be able to become more significant in terms of um, role models, right? There was a question here, which I really like, that was, uh, how can you manage to reinstall trust of various stakeholders into teachers? And I think trust, it's, it's a common theme in any industry that we're in. And it has to do with, you know, quality delivery. And if you're able to deliver quality, you will have the trust. You will have the authority, right? So question is, Michael, at Labster, um, you know, one of the things that excited us about you guys was that you got a bunch of teachers that were super passionate about the getting kids that were fundamentally unengaged, that were dropping out of STEM, school, STEM educations that they you know, fought really hard to get into in, some ca in many cases, yeah, yeah. and they were dropping out. Yeah. They were bored. Yeah. So what are some of the learnings that you've had in terms of getting this revolutionary content into the hands of the teachers and getting them to spread it further? So w w one of the most successful initiatives we do is where we, we bring teachers and students together in a conference similar to this, and then we ask the students to use this new education technology. And then we ask the students to explain to the teachers what they thought about it, what's, what, what was their experience. And it's always overwhelmingly positive, so much so that the teachers realize, okay, we, we need to do this, which is a much better way than us as ed tech companies going out and, and trying to convince the teachers. Uh, so that's one initiative that's been really, really successful. Another thing that works well, we talked a little bit about bottom-up versus top-down. There are top-down initiatives that actually work. Uh, in Canada, there's something called eCampus Ontario, which has been a great success for us, where uh, the government supports that the teachers spend time and resources on working together to adopt new technologies. And so I think it's, it should be a combination of bottom-up and top-down uh, in many of these cases. But what we're not, in, in, on a European level, we're not seeing those type of government initiatives, not at a large enough scale at least to make an impact, uh, to really empower the teachers because they are overworked. They have already a lot of things on their plate. Plus, it's a new technology and they need to learn. We need to somehow free them of a lot of the day-to-day -day work so that they can embrace new technologies. But come on, let's take a step back. We're in Finland, the country that pioneered phenomenon-based education. I love this concept. Tell us, how did that happen? Which one? The, uh the concept is actually, actually, actually an old one, oh. and it's been one of the fundamental, fundamental parts of the Finnish education already from the 60s. Okay. So, so what, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to find a way... We are all talking about 21st century skills, soft skills, 5Cs, 6Cs, 7Cs, and we, we are thinking is that how could you make that part of the, part of the, as a, part of the curriculum? And then we think that phenomena-based learning or project-based learning is probably the best one to make it happen. But it's complicated because I think that you can quite easily make that happen, implement that in a school level. But when you are trying to implement it in a system level, in every school of the country, it's complicated and it will take years. And at the moment in Finland, there's a lot of discussion about whether this is a, the right, right direction. Are we taking good care of our teachers? Are we putting enough resources in educating them? Are we creating great learning material and so on? And, and like, if you are thinking about change, change in a personal level is complicated. Change in a company level is complicated. Change in an ecosystem level <laughs> is extremely complicated. But that's what we are trying to do in Finland, because, because like, if you think that you are one of the best ones in the world, the only way to stay on the top is to challenge that one, take risks, re-innovate. Yep, move faster. Yeah. So one way we can think about making a system-wide change across the entire world is for all everybody to think about what I call 20% time, 
20% of the time do some kind of project-based, student-driven, student-interest-based learning. It differs for every country, so we're not going to tell you how to do it in your country, but 20% of the time devoted to the uh, education where the student is in charge. It seems like we're borrowing concepts from you know, the Googles of this world where 10% of your time or where 1% of... 20%. Yeah, 20, 20%? It should is. Be dedicated a little to bit borrowing. Projects, right? it's borrowing. Yes, from that. it works from Google. It works. <laughs> it's a Google, it works. Um, OK, Thanks. that's exciting. But and can I make one comment regarding that course. one? Because I think that there's another change we should make in education. Uh, whenever you are listening to the discussion about education in any country of the world, I'd say 90% of the discussion is negative. We are concentrating about the problems, we are concentrating about the system is broken, uh, and so on. And at the same time, there's great things happening in every country. So I think that teachers, are, teachers tend to be burnt out if all the discussion is negative. So I think that we should be excited about education, we should be telling success stories, we should empower teachers, because if, if that kind of excitement is not in the system, the change will never happen. So there has to be more excitement and positive examples in the discussion as well. Right. Right. Okay. And so <coughs> there was a question here that I think is really pessimistic, but I want to use it in any case um, because... Oh, it's gone now. Never mind. Oh, yeah, no, here it is. Mention something that works well in, in the educational system. So what do you think is working today, and where do we go from here? <laughs> so my program which is now the largest media program in the United States, yeah. with over 600 students voluntarily electing to take this program, is a big success. And I would like to suggest that other schools around the world do the same thing. Students come up with their own ideas for writing stories. They write them. They edit each other's stories. They publish in multiple formats, newspaper, magazine, television, radio, video, movies, everything. They get to decide the format. I'll tell you, they're so excited about this. That is true for all kids. Whenever you give them an opportunity to do something and the school supports it, they will do it. So that's a really positive thing and it could happen all over the world. Give the kids a voice. I mean, uh, how much time do I yeah. have? We are having three minutes left. <laughs> but but I, I could mention Brack schools in Bangladesh spreading works great. Design for change starting in India at the moment in 30 countries works brilliantly. What Esther is doing is working. Labster is working. There's a huge amount of examples that are working brilliantly. brilliantly and, and they are not getting enough visibility. So, yeah. so we, we sort of like get the feeling is that nothing in education is working. That's not the case. There's many, many examples that are working great. Good. And Michael? Yeah, I would also just add again that we do see more and more collaboration with governments. So governments working together with ed tech companies as part of advisory boards and so forth, which is something that we feel at least now is opening a lot of doors. So, so that's right. a positive trend. Right. Yeah. And so sitting here in five to 10 years time, do you think we'll, we'll have come to something like a crowdsourced global educational curriculum? Is there space for something like that? Or do you think it will still be local five, ten years from now? I think it's still local because I think it depends on your particular needs and your particular country, although there will be more international or crowd-based. Um, we all have our own particular needs and so what works in one country might not work in another country. And that's part of why I think a lot of these solutions are country-based. Right. And but, you know, what we're all kind of... The, the next step between why do we get educated is that we can enter the labor market, right? We're talking about automation and then the fear of unemployment. Well, that's <laughs> so, but that's a global problem, right? So right. can we uh, afford to think of education as local still? No, in that case, okay, we'll have to switch a little bit. Um, because I think we all need to teach all students everywhere computer skills. Basic computational thinking, it should start in kindergarten. And every child on the planet should be able to take it in school. Just like, you know, the best people to learn a foreign language are kids, right? Two-year-olds, three-year-olds, they can, you know, they can pick up a language in a minute. 
And so we should be teaching computer language to all kids. They can learn it really easily. Might be half hard for us as adults, but it's not hard for them. So that's one thing that will, should change dramatically for the entire planet. Good. Saku? So, uh, people are saying that schools are not changing. Schools are changing, but uh, the world is changing faster, and the gap is widening. So if we are not closing the gap in 2030, it will be problematic. And I think that the only way to close the gap is through scalable innovations, because that's the way the life changes in any other industry, whether it's Airbnb or Uber or Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And I'm fully confident that by 2030, we are having one, two, three global education initiatives, innovations that are changing the total landscape. It means that there's parts which are still local, but, but there's going to be global innovations as well, definitely. Good. Yeah, and I could add that I, we already see that within science, there's really a global curriculum and it, we teach the same things in China, in the US, in Europe, uh, and we see that trend continuing where there's more and more agreement on the curriculum across the world. So. Yeah, Good. I yeah. agree with the yeah. science curriculum yeah. should be global, and it is for the most part. Yeah. Perfect. We have 20 seconds left, so I, I guess I'll wrap it up by saying um, we've agreed on the globalization, personalization, giving students more power, and the teachers just accepting to learn new things, right? Yes. And getting encouraged, getting rewarded for that. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.